p.m. Even though I haven't had calculus for a long time, but I can do that. <laughs> That's R to the minus 1, right? So what's that? That is zero to the alpha. What's that? That is zero to the alpha. Yeah. Minus. And what? This becomes minus R to the minus 2, right? Yeah. Uh, so this becomes, so you can do this expression. This becomes minus, where does it? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Minus g n, we already said it, over r squared uh, r hat. The vector now points in the r, but it points in the negative r direction, right? So here's m, there's a point, there's g, points toward n. Right? Remember all? Think about this. Makes sense, right? Fair enough? Did, what did I do? No, I <coughs> think that's the letter above uh, the second term for variety of the line. So what is that? The R. Mm -hmm. okay. So the derivative with respect to R of this quantity gives you this. Yeah, it's a D. Sorry. I told you, I, you can watch my bad handwriting. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, D, D, R. So it's this is the function, and that's the derivative, right? So it's effectively d dr of that, right? Gives you that, gives you that. Doesn't matter whether you can do your derivatives or not. What's the point of this exercise? <laughs> the point of this exercise is this spatial operator, which is determining a gradient of something in a spatial dimension. Gives right, takes a scalar quantity, u, and generates a higher order quantity, a vector. So the potential energy function, the gradient of that potential energy produces a vector, or gives rise, you could represent it this way, as a force vector that is dragging me towards the infinity of the Earth. Which, so it goes from just a number to something that has magnitude and direction. But this quantity, like this quantity, varies spatially. Uh, so it'll have a variation in space relative to m. Now, if I change, there's an important feature of this particular quantity. For spherical coordinates, it doesn't matter kind of how I twist the coordinate system around. It's always going to be spherical coordinates. As long as I put the center of the coordinate at this position. So if I were to put the coordinates over here, I could still represent that mathematically, but it would be a bitch because I'd have to do this recalculation <laughs> for all those angles, right? Uh, but it's still the same number, right? It doesn't matter where I put the coordinate system. It will always be the same quantity. It just has different representations in terms of the numbers, the, the, the vector components that make it. Another way to put that is if you put a Cartesian coordinate system here, it would be the same issue. You could put the Cartesian coordinates on the center of that coordinate, you can move them around, those, those numbers or those vectors aren't going to change, but the relative components of the three vectors, as you change that coordinate system, are going to change. The numbers change, but the physical quantity doesn't change. It's just a represent, the coordinate system is just a convenience feature, right? That's the essence of what the difference is between vectors as a spatial reference and vectors that are a physical phenomena, and vectors that represent, or quantities, that re not just vectors, but quantities that represent a physical phenomena that obey those rules, you know, you just change the coordinate system, they don't change, but the numbers change, those are quantities called tensors. And you didn't know it, but you've been working with tensors for a long time, since you're in grade school, because scalars are a type of tensor in this context because they can be a physical phenomena, just like you, and vectors. You didn't do that in grade school, but <laughs> they are also a physical phenomena, or they can be represented as a physical phenomena, so they are also tensors. So then what are other things, right? Well, these are, this is a scalar. 
the cancer of order zero. That is cancer of order one. So what's two? Well, let's get an example, that's an analogy of what we just did here of generating a zero from a zero order quantity, a scalar, we generated a vector. So can we extend that in a different context? Let's take a vector and go another step from that. In that vector field, we're imagining it for a second. A vector field that is a description of motion. This point goes that far, this point goes that far, <coughs> that one goes that far. Part of that is rigid bottom, right? Everything's kind of moving in that direction. But this one's moving faster on that one, and that one's going faster yet, right? So you can imagine that that right here is a gradient in a displacement field. For every position, x, y, and so forth, there's a new position, and there's a vector associated with each of those. Don't worry about my crappy handwriting. I just talk. So there's a vector that goes with each one of those, and there's, but there's a spatial position where these things started and a final position where these things ended. This, this doesn't make a vector. What does it make, Okay. Uh, by the same analogy of a scalar giving rise to a, a vector quantity, this gradient gives rise to what's called the second order quantity. very skewed here at the moment, you might realize I said we were talking about kinematics, right? So we talked about displacement. So rigid body displacement or rotation. This quantity is the, the gradient of the displacement field. It goes from point A to point from undeformed state, final state, Every point in space is distorted relative to the adjacent point. And this is the qu this, this quantity, that's actually the quantity that relates to the thing we call frame. Uh, and it's quantity though, it's it's conceptually, I wouldn't call it straightforward, uh, <laughs> but it conceptually arises from this, but unfortunately the math is just a little bit tricky on that. So 